for joining us, everybody. It's good to see so many, uh, I say faces, but I see names. And uh, I hope we didn't scare you off from, and I appreciate the disclaimer because it's good to know if you're gonna be on. But you know, some of us wanna be famous. So if you wanna be famous, we sure love to see your face. It helps me, I like to connect with people. As you, as you know, Heather said you are muted um, and it doesn't need to stay that way. I'd love to hear from you. I like, like to have a discussion if we could. Um, so you're welcome to jump in with your comments and with your, your uh, and just kind of speak up as we go along here. I'd love to hear from you. I, I love this topic. It's a fun one, right? It's an interesting one. Um, and there are a lot of people here. And I think it's because this is a common concern. Like what are, how do we address some of these common challenges that we have in our families. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about what those issues are and how we're going to face it. I guess that we start with looking at, can it be done, right? <laughs> Do we ever feel hopeless that uh, you feel like this picture, you can relate, right? That moment when you're as a parent or as a, you know, there's lots of ways families are brought together, right? As a parent, as a spouse, as a child, you still have your own parents, we all have different situations that we face, but there are some commonalities. And so I want to talk about what that looks like, but you know, can it be done? Do you ever feel like you're just stuck in this, this ongoing rut, right? This, this pattern that just doesn't, you can never get out of. That's a the common experience. I think as, as a family member, it's just felt like there's something we can do about it, right? These things just seem to go on forever. Well, <clears throat> I hope the answer is yes. Cause if the answer is no, then this would be a very short presentation. If my next slide said no, I'd be like, thanks for coming today. It was nice. <laughs> Good luck. <clears throat> um, I think it can be done. That's why we'll continue, right? But what are the challenges? I'd love, anybody wants to, to jump in, please, let's talk about them. What are, and I know that you're like, I don't want to tell you because then I'll tell you what my challenges are. But um, I think it's good to share our challenges and maybe challenges you think you see others face. So jump in, talk to me, tell me what are the, what are some of the challenges that, that we face? <clears throat> My biggest challenge is co-parenting. Co-parenting. Okay. So co-parenting can mean co-parenting with your current spouse or co-parenting with an ex, right? These are Yes. Ex okay. in my case. And that adds a lot of com complexities, right? Stepchildren, uh, can get pulled into it as well. That can become an issue as well. But co-parenting your children with another spouse, that's a huge one, right? When values don't align, right? <clears throat> other children trying to be the parent, <laughs> effective communication, big emotions, right? Emotions, good good comments. They get they don't, gets involved in all of these, right? The big emotions gets pulled into everything. It makes everything tricky. Good comments. Any others? <clears throat> I have it's drama at bedtime with my little girl. Okay, <laughs> bedtime drama, okay. I have Doing a hard time um, trying to co-parent um, adult stepchildren. Mm. Adult stepchildren. So that's like two levels of difficulty, right? <laughs> Three levels, children, they're adults and their stepchildren makes it extra complicated. Good, okay. Yeah, we're, we, and we guys feel each other's pain right now. You relate to each other's challenges, being patient when you have your own crisis going on. Yes. Right. Trying to be the, the responsible adult when you don't feel very mature at the moment yourself, sibling rivalries, negotiating, stubborn kids, in-law drama, power struggles, man, you guys are nailing some really good ones here. Knowing to stand your ground and when to back off. That's the ongoing struggle. Live in granddaughter. Adult son and his family are staying up in your house off and on. It's hard. Get dumped on and watch the children. <clears throat> Man, I'm feeling it all with you. It makes us wonder why we sign up for this, right? <laughs> we probably should have another slide that says, what are some of the reasons that we're willing to do this to ourselves? Well, those are great, great examples. I'm going to throw up a list and see how well we've covered it. So my list, oh, why is, okay, here we go. The personalities clashing, disagreements over ways to do things. Jealousy, parents arguing, divorce separation, new step parents or step brothers. We talked about that. A parent relative having mental health problems, disability or illness, like addiction, things like that. Financial issues, grief, substance abuse, behavioral issues, mental health concerns, divorce, separation, and blended family. I think we kind of covered that a couple times here. Chronic illness, 
managing media. Nobody brought that up, I don't think. I'm surprised. I don't think anyone said trying to get my kids off their phone and connect. Maybe it relates to some of these other problems, I wonder. <clears throat> but I'm almost kind of surprised. It's often the top of the list. Consistency and routines, differences in parenting styles. Okay. So, and single parenting has, has been brought up. So the list can go on and on, right? One research, recent study on, this is very specific, right? I, this doesn't cover everything, but they, they looked at married couples with kindergarten age children. Now I realized, right, that this, this are, these things they argue about could change over time and think about how they might. But one research study showed this is what, <clears throat> and they've argued about the most frequently. Chores and responsibilities was the top of that list. And then money. Money is often considered the number one thing that, that couples fight about. But I guess with kindergarten age children, that maybe changes a little bit. Uh, children, 41%. Uh, um, sexual intimacy is fourth on the list, 38%. Spending leisure time, 33%. In-laws, someone mentioned that. Showing affection, religion, drinking, and other men or women, jealousies and concerns about that. So there's just some examples, right? <clears throat> but let's, let's dig a little bit deeper, okay? Let's talk about what's, what's underneath all of that. What are the basic core needs and the issues that really kind of underlie all of these surface issues? And these are important issues, right? But underneath the child who won't go to bed <laughs> at night, what is the core issue underneath some of this, right? We all want love. We all agree that feeling loved and, and being able to give love are core needs that we have, right? Feeling understood, like people under, they get us, we belong. Um, feeling important. Um, people will do all kinds of things to feel important like they belong. They'll join gangs and do awful things to, in, the, in the name of, of feeling like they belong somewhere, right? We need to connect. We need to feel safe, right? And we need to feel supported. Think about, and we need to have power in our life. We need to have power in life. What are your thoughts about this? Anybody have any thoughts about any of these that stand out to them and, and how they relate to all these other issues? So we have a thought about, I put power and somebody might think power, what, we don't need to have power, do we? In the sense that we are a power over another. Each one of these needs can take on an ugly version of how we try to get it, right? I wanna be loved. So I might actually try to sh get your love by, by being like unkind to you to try to see if you love me through it, right? And it's a power. I might, I might, because I feel like I'm not powerful enough in my own light, I don't feel empowered. I might feel like I need to, exert power over you and be controlling or rebel or something. Think about that child, that child that wants, that doesn't want to go to bed. They want to feel autonomous. They're working through a, a stage of life where they want to feel a sense of power in their life. And they don't want to be told what to do. Right. And that's a healthy, healthy thing that they're doing. But unfortunately, you know, it, it causes us a problem. Reading some of your comments here. These are good. Um, my children often have anxiety when they don't feel when they don't have a control over their situation, right? And don't we too, right? I feel the same way. So we can relate that, to that, right? Um, feeling empowered from us parents. So good comments. <clears throat> um, I don't know how that happened. It's like, that was weird. A green line just all of a sudden showed up on my PowerPoint. That's the weirdest thing. Um, so, oh, I went too far ahead. No, we didn't. We talked about these. So these are the kind of the underlying needs. And the reason I bring these up is because we could get stuck in the, in the weeds of all the specific issues, all these things we talked about. But we, but we really need to kind of like dig deeper and see what are the basic needs <laughs> uh, that are going on. Someone said, my favorite movie. You, you recognize that right away, right? Christmas Vacation. What a great movie, right? You remember the scene? It's one of the, I think it's the opening scene when they're singing songs and of course the parents are like yeah we're having a happy family moment and the kids are just kind of like oh this is lame right what are we doing dad and mom you're dragging us out in the wilderness to chop down a tree so you know this is like the quintessential family moment we try to create where everybody's just kind of being together and creating family togetherness and 
course in this movie, it turned into kind of a hilarious chaos. I wanna tell you a story of, of something I read in an article about um, what that can look like, right? We, I, I can relate to that, trying to create that family experience, driving through Arches National Park and pointing out the delicate arch and things like that and saying, you know what, tell me, you know, let's connect to nature, let's connect to each other. I read this, this article about this, just this family that did that. And in the front seat, the parents are kind of talking about what's around them and trying to connect to the kids. And the kids are acting like kids, but in the back seat, the teenage daughter was on her phone and was Googling, or not Googling, was in a group chat with a bunch of her friends researching and discussing ways that she could harm herself. And you think about that, the power of that moment, like here's a parent trying to create this family togetherness and this daughter is in the back seat trying to create and think about ways that she could harm herself. Like, isn't that part of our challenge is sometimes we wanna feel like we have this family unit and we can protect it and create this, this togetherness and these, all these nurture, all these things in our family and those walls have gotten thinner, like the things that can kind of get into our family and create havoc and chaos and, and pain kind of bleed in, right? It makes it difficult for us to create that experience for them. The happy ending of that story is that she got help, right? She, she did the right thing and got help and turned her phone into something better where she became part of a support group through her phone of other kids that felt like she did. But instead of trying to find ways to act that out together, we're providing support to help each other feel loved and connected and and giving the, those basic needs met. So it's hard. It's hard raising a family when there's so many influences that make that difficult to be successful. Um, but we can do it. And I, I like this. Um, does anybody want to volunteer to read this for us? This this comment made by Diane Lumens. Does anybody want to volunteer to read that out loud? Any of you great like I readers. Volunteer. Thank you, please. Hi, yeah. Um, if I had my child to raise all over again, I'd figure I'd finger paint more and point the finger less. I would do less correcting and more connecting. I'd take my eyes off my watch and watch with my eyes. I would care to know less and know to care more. I'd take more hikes and fly more kites. I'd stop playing serious and seriously play. I would run through more fields and gaze at more stars. I'd do more hugging and less tugging. I'd build self-esteem first and the house later. I would be firm less often and affirm more, much more. I'd teach less about the love of power and more about the power of love by Diane. Thank you. I like that. That still tugs at me every time I read that. I think that's a good, a good reminder. Um, the bigger purpose, right? We're trying to create, what's the goal of parenting? What's the goal of, of, of creating a family? What is it we're trying to build? Anybody want to speak to, what is the goal? What are we, what are we trying to do here? <laughs> I got silence on this question. I'm like, I don't know. What am I supposed to be doing? I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. I went, I don't know half the time. I'm just trying to survive the day, right? But we're we're trying to, aren't we just trying to create well-adjusted, happy adults, right? We're trying to create um, these us as adults, but also help these children be successful in life and feel feel take give them what they need to be to kind of go out and launch and be and be happy and well and have the tools they need. And sometimes we get stuck in making this moment the right moment and fixing this problem that we forget the bigger goal. Here's kind of a, a funny look at um, <clears throat> maybe one possible solution to some of your family problems. <laughs> okay, Max, I need you to put the game away. Time for a Durfee family meeting. <laughs> so how are things going, Max? Fine, I guess. Oh, that's great, sweetheart. Uh, we wanted to do things a little differently from our regular family meetings. Today, we want to do a performance review. Okay. 
Sounds serious. Oh no, it's just a formality. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oops. All right, let us start with the report card. Okay. Oh my. Oh, wow. Yeah. Is that... Uh huh. Yeah. Oh, I didn't even know it was possible to fail study hall. Huh. <laughs> it's a job paper. Yeah, and uh, look at his performance at home. So that's how that got broken. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Using the family printer for personal reasons? That's an infraction. Yeah. Honey, I think we know what we need to do. Am I grounded or something? Oh, no. We're going to let you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, what? This family is headed in a new direction. <laughs> and unfortunately, you're not going to be a part of it. <laughs> I don't understand. When we birthed you into this family, we saw potential. And you were really cute, so you had a lot of value. You were goal-oriented and on a trajectory to succeed. I mean, right here you wrote, I want to be an astronaut when I grow up. I mean, we were so excited, we sent out formal announcements at Christmas time. Uh, where are you on those goals? I guess I haven't been working towards that specifically. Yeah, you haven't really been working towards anything. Okay. Uh, your cuteness. <laughs> your cuteness has plateaued and your output has exponentially decreased. Yes. And uh, in the most recent consumer reports with the four grandparents, you were ranked last in the favorite polls. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares about them? You guys still like me, right? Let's keep it professional, Mr. Durkin. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, you know, it isn't just that. I mean, the economy hasn't been so nice either. And you're growing. There's no getting around that. You've been eating more, and that means it's been costing more. Plus, there are a lot of redundancies in our organization, and we just can't afford to pay you the increase in allowance for the same amount of work your sister will do for three-fourths the salary. Yes. <laughs> I mean, financially, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. I, I could get a job with your grades. Oh. You really are stupid. <laughs> <laughs> family memories the christmas parties well that's true but as i recall at the last christmas party you were rather unpleasant and completely ignored your aunt susan well, she's trying to make me wear that stupid sweater she made me okay, if there are any interpersonal conflicts you'll need to take that up with hr your hr well i guess that's settled then oh God. dad who's gonna go camping with you and watch the sports games with you well frankly i've never really cared for those things yeah. No. It's just something we did to keep up morale. Oh, I can't. But let, let, let us put it this way. This is an opportunity for you to reinvent yourself. So spread your wings and fly. I don't know what to say. Well, you don't need to say anything. We are, however, prepared to offer you some letters of recommendation. You know, the Johnson family just had a kid move off to college. So there's an opening there. We'll put in a good word for you. And your 401k will kick in in about 50 years. We've prepared a severance package consisting of two months allowance and an Xbox Live subscription. Your sister Jennifer will help you clean out your belongings. Guys, I'm like 15 years old, and that's the silver lining. You have your whole life ahead of you. <laughs> it was nice being your sister. <laughs> I guess we'll say goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Durfee. <laughs> hey, in three months, you'll be glad this happened. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you fell for that. Oh. <laughs> oh, no, that was true. Oh, no, dear. Oh, I'm glad everything's okay. Oh, no, no, everything's not okay. Your dog died. <laughs> we just did this to soften the blow. <laughs> I'm less sad than I thought I'd be. You're welcome. <laughs> hey, everybody. And uh, leave it good. And not All right. Keep those coming. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Anybody feel good with that solution? Anybody ready to fire any of your own kids? <laughs> so there's just, um, <clears throat> obviously, it uh, doesn't work, right? We want to keep the family together. Uh, so what are some more signs that your family's under stress, right? Signs of urgency, sense of urgency, less little time to spend together, 
sense of frustration, too much to do, desire for a simpler life, never time to relax, maybe explosive arguments. You feel like maybe uh, the family's pain and your own pain, like we've kind of highlighted the issues here, right? But you didn't come here to just talk about what the problems are. We're here to try to understand and fix, fix it together. At least start the discussion. Some more signs, I guess, watch for. One study showed um, that one of the most important things you can do is, is, is try to find a way to eat together. And so what happens is when we're stressed, sometimes that's difficult, right? And so me, Ill, meals are eaten in haste or skipped, and we don't have that connecting time. So people isolating in the room, constant rushing from place to place, escaping into work or their activities, unable to escape. So if you feel like you identify with many of these things, then, then you're not alone. Many people, this is a sign that your family may be under stress, a sense of guilt, like something just doesn't feel right. So as we talked about, what is the ultimate goal? What is it we're trying to accomplish? And, and, and how do we get there, right? Don't, don't we want a family that we feel connected to? Like there's this con sense of connection. There's this can-do attitude that we pretend and play, we have opportunities for mastery and have recognition. I'm interested, any more thoughts that you have about what it is, what is it that, that we're shooting for? Because if all we're trying to do is get away from something, like I wanna get away from this chaos, I wanna get away from this feeling that my family is, in, in, is struggling, then we're always looking over our shoulder and this kind of running away from the problems. We don't know we're moving towards. So I really believe that one of the more important things we could do is create a healthy dream about what we want. Not this unrealistic expectation, that's just problematic, but a healthy dream about what it is that we're trying to build. Does anybody have any additional thoughts about that? About what is it, what does that look like and, and, and what is it we're trying to create? Confidence, I love that. Thank you, Tiffany. Confidence, yeah, we want, we want our own, we want for our children, for everybody to feel a sense of like can do it right that can do attitude that we talked about this sense of and peace <laughs> thank you dan belonging and safety right i love what you said about peace uh one of the the author steve seligman who does a lot of martin seligman who did a lot of um work on this positive psychology feels like a lot of his books are mistitled about happiness when he said really happiness is fleeting it's peace that we really attain to lasting memories, a safe space, resilience, great comments. Great. Those are good goals, right? Isn't that, that's a positive attitude and approach to what we're trying to create. And, and look at how all of these problems, how do they help us create that? Like for example, resilience, if you had this wonderful family bubble where no problems happen and everything went perfectly, and then you launch them into the world, how resilient are they, right? So I, I think that the home is a great laboratory for creating the experiences that we need. Those lasting memories, many of those memories come from <laughs> funny, what at the time was not great things, right? Like, oh my gosh, like, you know, the, the, the car, the, the, I'll give you an example of mine. A, a lasting memory for me was when I went inside, I borrowed my friend's car, I was going to work, I went in to change my clothes and my son, my brother comes in and says, I was like 16 year old. My, son, my brother comes in and says, um, your car is in the neighbor's camper. <laughs> like what? I go out and the car had disengaged from being in gear and rolled off our little ledge and was literally sticking out of our neighbor's camper. Not a fun experience, but certainly created a lot of lasting memories, right? So we had this kind of laboratory in our family to create learning experiences so that we can be ready for life. So that's the good news, right? Every time you, we, we mess up and we have an experience, just think to yourself, we just created another opportunity for you to grow. <laughs> Some research on, on kind of how, we, how that kind of works out, it was really done well, and it kind of showed how we can, <clears throat> what really helps us be successful, helps our children to be successful. And they looked at assets, and then the protective factors and things that, that we can build to help kind of insulate us and help us be protected and to be successful. And I'm not going to go through each of these in detail, but there's the support, right? That's the kind of the velvet around the iron 
of life, right? Like it's the thing that softens the blow, support, a family support, church groups, caring, school climate. One study showed that if, if a child has even one supportive, loving, nurturing adult in their life, that their outcomes are, are much better than if they don't feel like they have that one person. So even one adult can make, give that to a child. You know, a feeling of empowerment, right? Uh, that's an asset of service and safety and resources, boundaries and expectations, right? This makes a good case for why we try to create discipline and, and have boundaries. And then constructive use of time, getting them engaged. Those are the assets that as you build these, then when they're withdrawals of life and problems, these create that buffer, allow us to be successful. Those are external assets. Internal assets are the, the characteristics and the skills that we develop to help us to be effective, right? Commitment to learning, positive identity, um, social competencies, positive values. These are, these are some of the internal assets that help us be successful um, and insulated again against the challenges of life. And it's hard because how do we give internal assets, right? How do I give the gift of caring to my children? If it's, you know, how do I, how do I help them to instill that value within themselves? I, those, that's a constant challenge and question, isn't it? Um, how do I help them to, to have a sense of power and self-esteem? We're going to talk more about that, but I'd love to get your thoughts about how do we, how do we provide and develop those assets? So we, if, you, if you look at like the studies on child development, it helps us to understand like what are they, the developmental needs of the different ages that they, that they, um, that they go through. And that we, we've learned that there's, and you remember this, maybe if you took your, your psychology 101 and child rearing classes, but this is very important to understand that it, it, different ages throughout their life, we have different kind of initiatives that we're trying to, live through we're trying to develop in that very early stage you come into brent this planet a brand new person like it's this feeling of, of it's scary and can i trust my environment from that zero to one and the outcome of that is if yes i can trust then the attribute we can build is hope so as you could see with hope will purpose competency fidelity think how that relates to the earlier if we can help them successfully work through these important developmental needs, then we can create those internal assets that help them be successful. That when life is difficult, they have the tools that they need. But I, I'm here to tell you, I know that sometimes even if you create a trusting environment, that the person has their own like frame that they work that through. Like you might do the same things with your children and they come out with different outcomes because they interpret that differently. It's what makes this one of the challenges that makes it difficult is how do I help that get through to this child, right? Your three-year-old who doesn't want to go to bed is working through this developmental issue of autonomy. They want to feel like there's, they're a self. They're no longer just dependent on you in total ways. They, they have a, a willpower. And, and that's good. When we see that, we say, you're, you're going to make it. <laughs> Even though you're frustrating me right now, you're doing what you need to be doing right now. You need to be, you're trying to send, have, create a sense of selfhood. And if we can understand that, it helps us have a patience and helps us to, uh, to, to channel it appropriately. We're not going to say, yeah, you are on your own <laughs> at three, but we are nurturing that in a way that we help channel that a little bit. So <clears throat> this next piece, I think in a lot of ways, if, if you had a takeaway from this, I, I really feel power very strongly about this, this continuum that we're going to kind of look at together, this grid. Okay. So, so kind of hang with me. And if you have any comments or questions about it, I'd love to hear them. But a lot of our research, this is evidence-based stuff shows that there are two axes. Okay. Of things that, that really create the overall experience that we're looking for to create a uh, successful family. And one of those is if you look on the high low bar here, was that, is that the Y axis that goes up and down? It's been a long time since I've been in math, but you have your X axis and your Y, right? <laughs> I just lost some of you because I'm talking about math, but the up and down <laughs> is the sense of control. 
Okay. So that, that what I'm speaking of here is me as a parent in our family, and this could really apply to anybody in the family, but me as an individual, what is my sense of control? Now that word, when I say control, type in the chat or you can speak up. What does that conjure up for you? Is that, what does that mean when I talk about control as a parent? Is that a good thing? Or am I talking about something negative? Um, what does control kind of bring up for you? Any comments on that? All right. Well, consistency, boundaries, control of oneself. Okay. Absolutely. And I love that you, those are two ways to define this is what I want to bring home. Those are good things, right? So what I'm not talking about here is the kind of ugly control where I need to exert that over others in an unhealthy way. We're talking about boundaries, consistency, and, and control of oneself. And so, yes. So in other words, the more, the better of the, the right kind. And it's sort of a willingness to say, I need you to be successful. I, I need us to not settle for anything less than, than making it in life, right? It's that willingness to sort of hold them to that. It's what we might call discipline, right? That built the willingness to hold people. I like the term resolute. It's like that, like, I'm going to make this happen kind of attitude. That's an essential part of, of, of parenting is to have that attitude, okay? And then, then you have the other axis, the one that goes across, we're going to call that caring or loving, right? And there's never too much of that either. It's that sense that you matter, you matter. And someone talked about self-esteem earlier and self-esteem is that, that sense that no matter who or what I do, I matter, okay? I, I matter. Uh, it's not connected to my behavior. I matter as just because I'm a person. So as we put these together, you can see how they interact, okay? If I'm a high, let's start at the bottom here. I, in the chat, or you can speak out, what does it look like when a parent or as parents, we have a, an environment where there's low control and low caring? What is that? What kind of environment does that create? What, how would you describe that kind of parenting? Disengaged, chaotic, lack of structure, negligent. A couple of you said ne neglect. Yeah. Why would a parent act that way, right? Do we just assume they don't love their children? They just wish they hadn't had them. There's no accountability. There's free range parenting. Yep. People talk about free range. And there can be a number of ways that comes about, right? Someone said before, when you have our own stuff, right? I have so much of my own stuff. I might just be disengaged because I'm just trying to survive. Maybe it comes from, they don't like conflict, life stressors. I'm just distracted, right? Can it come from a sense of hopelessness? I've tried to make a difference and it doesn't seem to ever help or work. It's that hopelessness about it. Our parents are depressed. There's a lot of reasons and understandably, like I think we need to have compassion on a lot of reasons that we might get into that place. But the outcomes are pretty, you know, pretty predictable, right? It's just, some kids are resilient and they overcome it, right? They just do well in spite of their circumstances, but it's not a great environment, right? What does it look like when you have a high control, low caring parent, like really good on the discipline, not so great on love and affection. What does that create? What kind of parenting, how would you describe that parenting style? Okay, authoritarian, walking on eggshells. People will have to walk on eggshells around you, right? The tiger mom, someone said, okay. That, that real command and control kind of person, right? And, and it might be kind of the tough love approach, you know, there's, it can create a lack of trust as somebody said, right? Um, and then if you have the other side of things where you have the really high control, sorry, low control, high caring, Okay, you got kids will rebel. That's right, Scott. They, the kids will some eventually learn you can't control me anymore out of this in this way. And and those efforts that worked when I was five, they stopped working or even stop working now. <laughs> On your three year old who doesn't want to go to bed and learns you can't make me right. Cop mode is what my son uses to describe that. Okay, bad cop version. And so, what about the high high caring, low control person? What how do you describe that? Enabling right? Any, 
Any other thoughts on the high carrying low control? Hippie parents, yeah, okay. And I just love, and, and isn't the goal here, no guidance? I think we believe and hope and in this realm that it, if I just love you enough and I've had shown enough care, I'll set the kind of tone where you'll just want to do the right thing with your life. Or maybe I don't care what you do with your life. I, I should hope that isn't the case. But without that, you just hope that just through love that they'll want to please. But that doesn't really actually work. Just like on the other side, being high control, it's like I really, you can really love somebody and come from that angle but you just you believe that I have to control that or you're not gonna succeed without me doing that. So you can see how that it's out of balance. And there can be this tendency, let me just slide, move to the next slide here, to, um, to sort of create a good cop, bad cop situation in your home where like I see, you might see your spouse as high control, low caring, and so you think I gotta compensate. So I'm gonna be the nice guy rescuing parent and you can be the command and control. And between the two of us, hopefully we've created a balanced thing and understandable. And you know what? Kids sometimes turn out all right, but really doesn't that just create kind of a sense of inconsistency and conflict, right? And there's this tendency to just try to balance each other out. Isn't it better if we can find a moment where at the same moment, this is hard to do because I find this too. I'm, I'm also a parent and I know how hard it is to have that sort of vulnerable kind of love and affection for my child at the same very exact same moment that I'm asking them to be successful and to step up and follow through with their commitments. Like it feels like this poll says back out of affection and just become stern, right? Like it's sometimes hard to find this place where I can bring them together. But when we can and when I do, the message gets across that it's because I love you, I'm asking you to step up and succeed and because i want to help you accomplish your goals and the things that matter to you right and it's so hard because in our house different things are important to each parent yes right because we even have different versions of what that looks like right and what we even want to accomplish my spouse might want me to kind of back up that she really needs to make sure that this I don't know. I'm trying to give an example that we're getting to bed at this time. And I'm like, I don't even think that's too early. I don't, why are we sending him to bed so early? Like I, we may not agree and I'm supposed to kind of back you up. Right. So that certainly gets in the way. Right. Um, talking about the, yeah, one of the benefits of it, a single parenting thing is you may not have somebody else to argue with you about that. Um, but you say you've been divorced for four years and still can't figure it out. It's like, Maybe I wish I had someone to help me balance me out, right? So there's kind of pros and cons to, to that, right? Sometimes like there's some things simplified a little bit when you're a single parent, but they get way more complicated in other ways. Like I wish someone else was here to rescue me right now and participate. Um, so what do we do? Well, of course we have to set the role. We're role models, right? Like there's not a lot, the whole uh, monkey see, monkey do, no matter what I teach and say, if, if I'm acting out a certain way, they're going to follow my example sometimes. So how do we treat others fairly? How do we show our love? How do we approach problems with the can-do attitude? How do we take responsibility? If I'm teaching my son about how you got this, you got this. Meanwhile, he sees me just kind of give up. That, what kind of really message am I sending, right? I'm not trying model self-disciplining, taking time. Um, and so we're creating a love-based, highly disciplined approach in the, in the positive sense of discipline, what that means, which means discipline means to teach and to instruct. Um, that's is not the goal. And then let's reflect back all these issues we talked about, right? All these issues that we're concerned about, how do we then become more successful in getting them to bed on time? How do you become more successful? And we're dealing with adult stepchildren who don't want to listen to our influence anymore, right? How do we work with all these kind of issues that we're talking about? Hopefully we've created the, the tool, which is the relationship. The relationship is the tool. And um, from there. So I, I, can any of you relate to this day? I know I'm not going to go through each one of these, but this is kind of a day by a minute by minute kind of analysis of your day you had with your teenager, right? And if you kind of read through that, you could see, does this sound familiar to any of you? You feel like you're just kind of on their case all day long, trying to get them to kind of engage and be successful. Um, and you have all these little conflicts about dinner and about um, what they're doing with their time. You're spending too much time texting and on your phone and you know, it's not till 11.15 when they're asleep that you look at them and say, I love you. 
because they're always cuter when they're asleep, right? <laughs> All your kids. <clears throat> but can we relate sometimes? When you reflect on your day, think of the last um, interaction, the last day of interactions you had with your family, your kids, your spouse, and how much of that was spent just harping on problems or how much of it was avoidance of problems? How much, how much real connecting was going on? And I hope by asking that, I'm not here to make you feel guilty. Like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm horrible at this. It's really just a chance to say, you know, I'm not alone. Other people are doing this too. It's just, how am I going to turn that around? And how am I going to create more positive, loving interactions? Because that's where your power as a parent comes from, is their sense that they love you and they trust you and they know you're looking out for them. So in that setting, we create limits. And I would love, as I talk about this, if anybody would be willing, I would love to hear your strategies and your ways that you do this that work. And you can also share what's not working and <laughs> your frustrations with that. We're all here for you. This is like group therapy. Talk about your problems, but also share maybe what, what are the things that work for you and setting limits, rules, and boundaries, because it is an important part of being a parent. That's the high control, resolute side of things, right? Um, Discipline with love, being positive. Um, as you're chiming in on some of these, these chat messages, and I'll keep them coming, those are great. I, I just kind of want to reflect on the study that was done with rats and mice to teach us a little bit about ourselves. And they found that the most tempting kind of parenting style is punishment because punishment has an immediate impact. We see it work immediately, and it does. It is more effective in creating immediate behavioral change, punishment does. Okay, that's the positive side of punishment. But the negative side is it has the worst long-term outcomes. With mice in a maze, they were given, some, some were given a punishment every time they took a wrong turn. <clears throat> and those mice got through the maze quicker than the mice who were either just wandered and to find their way, or the other group of mice who, who were given a reward every time they took a good turn. And those mice took longer. They kind of wandered, but they got there. But then when you got rid of all of the punishment and discipline and you just said, Here, you stick them in there and you stop doing anything, guess which mice made it to the end? We create memories about where to go and how to get there through positive um, experiences. The mice who were, took the parents, the parents, <laughs> the parents of the mice, the people doing the study that, that rewarded found that they memorized the mice better and they were more willing and wanted to get through it, wanted to get to the end. They learned that was a good thing to do. They enjoyed it. They, even if you stopped giving them the reward, they said, this is cool. I like being successful. And they, they got out of the maze. Whereas the mice that were punished the whole time, you, you had to keep going or, and you had to get harder with them. Like the swing punishment didn't work anymore. You know, I got to yell louder. And that's why we get caught in this trap where we have to get even louder with our discipline. So thank you for your, some of your comments coming in. I want to kind of review some of them. Um, thanking your kids constantly. Absolutely. Try to go by the 80-20 rule or maybe even better 90-10, which is the best, the best direction you can give is to build on what they're doing well. Giving them an, it's an image of, I'm a good, I'm a successful person. I do a lot of good things. And sometimes the fear is, I talk to some adults and they say, well, that just gives a sense of you know, it sends the wrong message that, that everything they do is fine and they don't need to improve. Well, I would say check your, your beliefs about how people improve and what makes them tick because, because maybe that's come goes back to your own childhood and your own beliefs about that. But um, people that feel like they have an identity being a good, successful person want to act that out. And that's what we want to create. So constant thinking, even for things they're supposed to do. So all they're supposed to, why would I think? When the, ex when the rule is all the expectations are, if you meet my expectations, there's no thank yous, but my expectations are set high, kids give up. Like I get straight A's and no one says anything. If I get one B, I'm in trouble. Like I'll give up, you know? So make sure where, where of what is expected of them, right? Don't just say, you've been on your phone too long, get off. Like well, it was too long. Today, yesterday, you were fine. I was on it all day. And today it's too long. I've been on it for an hour. Like that's inconsistent, creating guidelines and expectations. Thank you, Tiffany. Great point. Um, getting your kids to bed earlier so you can have time together. 
And I love that, Brenda. Make, see, making sure they know that your connection time is important for the whole family, not just for you as a couple, but you want us to have that time. We're going to be better parents and we're going to like you better, <laughs> right? We say, I love you a lot. Um, and the kids never listen. They will get angry a lot. Help them set the boundary. Love that. Help them set the boundaries. Help them learn to do that. Help them and obviously lead by example. Great comments. I can read all of these. They're great comments. <clears throat> so creating this nurturing atmosphere, I think a lot of the things you're commenting on will do that. Uh, being involved. They don't care about the rules. If you just don't show up, how, do you, how are you engaged and involved? Are you asking the questions? If your questions are all about their behavior and how, how good of a child have you been, then you just take on a certain role in their life. But if your questions are, tell me the best thing that happened to you today. What's the funniest thing that happened to you today? Not just how was your day? Because it gets old. If you ask, if I ask my 10 year old, how was your day? It's fine. It's like, what's the funniest thing that happened to you today? Is anybody at your school just doing weird things? Like, like let's ask specific questions, like get to know them in their lives, what happens, right? And then that second bullet point, listen, like listen, be there, put your phone aside and engage, be there and listen. And even if it's about how awful you are as a parent, <laughs> hopefully they're doing it not that way, but like, listen, let them be heard and show that respect, take time, have a sense of humor, make it fun, right? So here's the philosophy of building a character. Mistake is made and there is space to feel empathy and compassion. I know that feels enabling, right? We're worried, like I make mistake, I'm rewarding them for bad behavior. That's not true. We're not rewarding the behavior. We're, re we're rewarding their humanity. And we're saying, I make mistakes and I can have compassion and empathy for how you might feel. And by the way, they own it better. I promise you, <laughs> it doesn't seem like it's logical, but when we give them their own space to own it and not tell them we own it for them, I'm going to tell you that that was wrong. I'm going to make you see and how the consequences come from the outside. If I can just pause and say, what do you feel? When you treat your sister that way, when you see that happen and you're, and you're arguing and fighting, what does that make you feel? And if they don't feel anything, it's interesting. Like you haven't connected to that and help, how do we help them connect to their own empathy and compassion? We need to feel it for them and give them a place to, to feel that. Adult feels empathy, empathy and compassion. Kids learning from the consequences. There's still going to be consequences because of what happened Here's what needs to, here's what we need to do. There are consequences. So that empathy and compassion can be there and consequences, right? There's not one or the other. Okay. Taking time for family fun. Take it outside. I know the power of the off button. More important than ever is the ability to disconnect from those other things. Okay. More principles um, that to kind of look at it. I will treat you with respect so you will know how to treat me. Feel free to do anything that doesn't cause a problem for anyone else. Now, I, I, I hesitate to, as we talk about this respect piece, to I, I could give you plenty of examples of my parenting failures. So please take this story in, in that light because I, I, have, I struggle like all of you. But it was a decision I made very early uh, not to use corporal punishment. And I'm not saying if you do, you're the worst parent ever, but um, I understand there's, there's people have their own logic, but we decided not to use spanking or of any kind for problems. If I spank my kids, it's because we're playing. <laughs> we're just wrestling, right? But we don't, we didn't do that. And it, for me, I don't know if it's coincidence or not. But my kids never hit each other. It just didn't become a problem. And they don't have those issues. And I don't know if that's, again, I, I don't know what to take credit for or not. I think as parents, we often don't take, we, when things go right, we don't give ourselves any credit. And when things go wrong, we give ourselves all the blame. So I'm willing to give myself a little credit on this. But one thing that we did do is I say they don't, it happened before. And one time I remember that it did happen when they were very young, my daughter hit her sister. And I, I kind of said, how did you feel? What made you feel like you needed to do that? And I, I just had empathy for like the feelings of the moment. Like, yeah, you were angry and you felt like she needed to be taught a lesson, right? I get that. Like, so let's talk about what you did with that. And then we kind of talked about that and how that worked. Now, how do you feel about that? And then I said, when, do you think dad and mom ever feel the same way you do? Like you really can frustrate me and I feel like you need to be taught a lesson. Yeah. Well, what do we do? And we try to use some modeling to say, we don't hit you. What do we do instead? We try to talk it out with you. 
And we, what we wanted to model was there are better ways to solve than to hit. Okay, so again, please don't take from that that that's the only way to parent, and that I'm a great parent. <laughs> But that, that, was a, that was a moment for me like, yes, we got something right. And I think you got to do that for yourself. Think about your own, I got it right moments and, and, and give yourself credit for that. Because I, I don't think we drink enough from the successes. We, we constantly beat ourselves up over the problems we have. So we need to do that once in a while. But treating people with respect, giving them the control. Uh, one study on power play showed that if you give your young children a five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes to say, you're in charge. You obviously can't break anything or hurt anyone or drive the car. Like <laughs> there's rules here. But beyond that, you can play, we'll play Monopoly your way. You want to decide that the, the railroads mean our, our castles? Fine. Like we'll do it your way and we're going to play your rules. Like, what do you want to do? You're in charge. And it's shown that actually, contrary to what you might be afraid of, the more power you give children in appropriate ways, the less they demand and try to get it in inappropriate ways. At bedtime, they see you as a reasonable parent who will give control when it's appropriate and they don't hunger for it in the ways that are inappropriate. So give the power where you can so you can retain it where it's needed, right? And, and that gives them choices, right? Are you going to clean the garage or mow the lawn this week? Which one do you want to do this week, right? When you, you can decide when you mow the lawn and when is that going to be? Is it going to be Saturday like a lot of people do or do you want to do it on a weeknight, right? I want to talk about this parenting house and bring this together, right? How do we bring a lot of these concepts together and create this, this feeling of our home? So you got a picture of our pretty little home that we've got here. So how do we create that? At the foundation is to create a strong, stable relationship. Now I know it says strong, stable marriage. Okay. But you know, there are a lot of family styles and some of you aren't married and that's okay. Right. But when it's there, when you are, we want that to be a relationship where they're not playing you off of each other. You do want to focus on the parent. Let's put this way. You can substitute strong, stable marriage to strong, stable authority system. So if you're co-parenting with another person, it's, I know it's tricky because you don't control what the other person does and how they act. But the best you can, you own your part in trying to create a strong, stable leadership structure, okay? And then from there, you have the role modeling. That, these are foundational things. And then built on that, you have your walls, which are the limits. And then you have the warmth of the home is created through that nur nurturing atmosphere and a love base. That love base is like the carpet, right? It's this thing that softens it. And of course, your roof, which is taking time for family fun. So just a kind of a way to bring that all together and see what our family looks like. So um, reflect on a couple more comments that are here. Um, thank you for bringing them. Um, we're almost out of time, but I want to read some of those. If I can get my mouse to go to the right place. There we are. Um, someone said, talk through the consequences and that why they happen and what is reasonable. Perfect, right? Oops, didn't mean to do that. And I'm... The more food I hear, the more I want to do it. Uh, or good, <laughs> thank you. You corrected yourself. The more food, the more food I hear, the more I want to eat it. Is what I would <laughs> certainly relate to. But yes, also the more good I hear, the more I want to do it. Good. I am. More, I am. Th that kind of reflects on that comment we made about how people are building on your positive, and you build a self image. Like I'm a. I'm a good person. Why wouldn't I want to keep doing that? I'm away from work a lot. So I try to be available to help her spend time with them when I'm home. Perfect. You know, the, the study that said family eating together, dinner together has some of the best outcomes. You know what? Like that doesn't work all the time. Like I, there's been significant parts of my life, my career. I worked evenings. I'm like, am I, is that, am I doomed to fail then? No, you just got to get creative, right? Like how do you build those experiences um, with if you don't have the traditional five o'clock meal? So, and Tiffany, you're saying that you, that's, you got to do what you can work with the time that you've got and make it valuable. Right. Um, thank you. I have a nine-year-old with autism, a six-year-old daughter and 12-year-old son. How do you avoid having, and I keep scrolling in the wrong place here, a double standard when parenting. Thank you. Right. Like you might think one child has certain needs and these certain ways of doing things. Another, you got to treat them differently. 
thank you. Let's talk about that. If you create a personal relationship, that's why family togetherness isn't enough. You got personal relationships. So you can sit with them and say, how do I meet you in your need? Someone brought the comment earlier about how together you create the rule, the discipline. Like, what, is, what does that look like? What are the rules that we need to live by? And then I think you need to have conversations with them about that, about, about how, why, why we're doing this differently with you than them. And there's got to be a certain level of, uh, I think, kind of what my parents would say, which is kind of you leave some of that up to me. <laughs> there's always a level of you're not going to, a 10 year old isn't going to understand all the complexities, right? But what they do understand is you love them, they feel that. And then you can say, with that love, I'm trying to help you in the different ways that you need to be received and worked and helped. And it's a little bit different for your sister or your brother because we have different ways as well. I'm open to that. And they think the fairness issue. And so I'm open to that. Talk to me about it. Maybe you're right. Maybe the, maybe we are being inconsistent and unfair. Let's look at that and we can fix it. But also maybe the reason <clears throat> he has a different bedtime than you is he's not falling asleep in school and struggling with that. Like, I hate to do the comparison stuff. So I'd, instead of saying it that way, I'd say the reason you have this bedtime is because you're falling asleep in school and you're not getting your stuff done. Leave it implied and out of it that, well, your brother's not doing that because I hate comparisons. It's something that's hard to avoid, but I think is important to try to avoid those comparisons. But but trying to kind of focus on what, what does this mean for you, right? Uh, someone could relate to those some of those issues that were kind of raised. I know we're about out of time. Um, and I know we haven't solved all your problems. I know if I've disappointed you and that you you kind of hope we'd solve them all for you today, uh, it's ongoing. And maybe one thing I could just share is that the reason this title, it says resolving common family problems, you're just not gonna solve them. And the expectation you're gonna solve them is what commonly makes the creates the problem. Guess what? This is messy. But remember, we're creating resilient kids and it's gonna be, it's gonna be uh, messy, and that's okay. Embrace the messiness of it. That's sometimes the chaos is the beauty of it, right. That's the reason we relate to that movie of them driving off under the semi and over and, and you know on Christmas vacation. It's like we can relate to the chaos, but let's make it a beautiful family chaos and, and full of love and patience and, and and growth and acceptance and forgiveness, and move on and say, you know what this is beautiful chaos. Let's make it so. And so I know it's not easy. Um, I hope that something we've shared will, will make a difference for you and your parenting. If you feel like this kind of tickles at something that, um, that you might need to explore further. And remember, support is an important part of this. Like you need to feel like you have other people to help you. We're here at Blomquist Hill as part of the solution for you. We are your employee assistance program and want to help you with these challenges. If we need to problem solve with you, please um, please do um, reach out. And Kelly said, embrace the messy. I love that. Find join the journey and not just the destination. And I, I echo that. Thank you, Kelly. And thank you all for being here. This was fun to, to have this discussion with you. Wish you the best in your, in your celestial chaos. Have a good day.